Good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Uh, welcome from Ashri Falcon chapter in our uh, technical webinar uh, over here. Uh, I know we disappeared for uh, quite uh, time, but uh, uh, for the unpleasant COVID-19 uh, scenario, we didn't been able to conduct our technical seminar as usual. Uh, but uh, I think now we are uh, coming back as a Falcon chapter with full force in uh, through the webinar uh, system. Uh, I hope all of you will be safe and uh, working well. Uh, our uh, our webinar uh, today. Uh, 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 first, we need to start with ASHRI Code of Ethics. Uh, in this uh, and all other ASHRI meetings, uh, we will act with honesty, fairness, courtesy, uh, competence, inclusiveness, and respect for others, which exemplify our code values of excellence, uh, commitment, integrity, collaboration, volunteerism, and diversity, and shall avoid all real and perceived conflict of interest. Energy is very important in our uh, uh, environment in any in our day-to-day uh, -day use and this uh, seminar today is touching one of the biggest problem we are facing in uh, our industry uh, here which is the low delta T syndrome. Uh, low delta T syndrome is a condition which is a low chilled water return temperature increases the amount of chilled water uh, to circulate in order to meet system cooling loads and chillers uh, receiving uh, low chilled water return uh, temporarily cannot be loaded uh, to their design capacity. The low delta T syndrome uh, is uh, uh, creating a lot of uh, trouble in the systems uh, due to increasing the flow of the GPM. In the example here, we are using a capacity of 500 uh, uh, of uh, GPM delta T of around uh, 1,000 ton here. If uh, the flow rate uh, GBM is around 80 uh, GPM in a chilled uh, water delta T of 13 Fahrenheit, which is 100 uh, and retain is 54. If we reduce the 54 Fahrenheit to 53, we'll find our uh, flow and the GPM is increased to 104. If it has been reduced one more degree to 52, it will go uh, 109 and 79 percent extra and if we go to 50 uh, if the flow of the GPM will increase from 80 to 370 which is mean 400 percent 49 cannot be attained because it will be more than 400 uh, design GPM uh, in the system just to give you an example how many chiller you need to operate with every uh, load at the uh, reduction happening so that if in example if you need one chiller for 1000 uh, GPM in delta T 16 uh, if this delta T reduced uh, to 12 uh, F over here then you will require two chiller to, uh, to, for, uh, to, uh, to, to use it for the same flow and your flow will move to the 2000 GPM if your delta T uh, of your T uh, reduced to nine Fahrenheit, then you require three chiller to working over there. Six Fahrenheit, you need four chiller to do over there. So that uh, this is here show you how much the damage can happen to the to the to the chiller plant is operating all this impartial load uh, while only uh, you needed around 600 ton in in, in the whole scenario for the. Uh, uh, which can be run with the one chiller only over there. As you know, the uh, the equation of the chiller uh, of the flow is that is Q design is uh, BCB uh, multiplied by the delta uh, by the delta T. Uh, what is causing this low delta T? Mainly, what I found it, yeah, partially it can be through this uh, the secondary network, but the major uh, problems can happen in the uh, building itself or through the building itself. So that uh, I put here around 14 reasons for this low delta T, which we will tackle several of these reasons today in our presentation. It can be ember coil uh, and control valve selection. It can be dirty coils. It can be dirty air filters, uh, loose belt HUs. It can be mismatched design conditions, 
many consultants uh, used to over design the buildings and uh, creating this uh, low delta T syndrome uh, in the building. Uh, using three-way valve to control the valve, this is one of the uh, conditions, low supply, air temperature, system differential pressure above the valve, shut off if you are using typical on-off valve in your FCU. Uh, coil uh, piping uh, configuration, coil uh, uh, plant, chill water mixing, the loads that you can have in the plant itself if they use uh, secondary pump, uh, not really uh, many through the delta P in the network. Or as I said, uh, building the coupler flow for, uh, from the chilled water supply. All these causes uh, going on can create the low delta T syndrome. Anyway, just uh, to not take more of your time, uh, allow me to introduce our uh, presenter today. Our uh, presenter will be uh, George Hill, uh, the product manager for our, uh, valves and actuators. Uh, based on Siemens Smart Infrastructure Headquarters in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. He's responsible for electronic dynamic balancing solutions. Uh, he'll hold master's degree in science of mechanical engineering and started his career in 1994 as a regional product manager for district heating controls and valve uh, actuator in Germany. Uh, our second speaker will be uh, Luca uh, Paroli. Oh, uh, the global product uh, manager uh, for valve and actuator, also based in the Siemens Smart Infrastructure Headquarters in Switzerland. And he have a master's science in mechanical engineering and started his career uh, technician working in Italian valve and actuator manufacturing industry. Over the past 15 years, uh, probably he has been working with uh, the HVAC application and uh, with uh, the product uh, promoting PICV uh, technology. Uh, from here, I would like uh, Mr. Luca uh, to go ahead with the, uh, his presentation. Welcome, Mr. Luca, and please go ahead. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I just need to open my presentation and then I'm ready to run. Just give me a quick confirmation. You can you can see the slides. Then we are ready to go. Yes, um, it I'm is going. Good. Thanks a lot. I'm going to close my camera for uh, for during the slide deck so that you can focus on the slides. You don't need to see my my ugly face. But then I will be back uh, with you for the Q and A session. Uh, all right. Yep, perfect. I think we are ready to go now. Uh, so once again, good morning, gentlemen. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Luca Baroli, and uh, I work for the Global Product Management Department of Valves and Actuators at Siemens Smart Infrastructure. I'm, as always, uh, uh, over the last time, I was uh, taking Astra seminars uh, in place, but uh, it's always an honor even to be on uh, via remote. So thank, thanks a lot for joining. And the target of today's presentation is how to improve the energy efficiency of hydronic distribution systems in buildings with intelligent valves. However, before we get there, and uh, I let my colleague here to, to discuss in detail this topic, I'd like to give you an overview of where the technology uh, in this industry stand. Sorry, not, not move forward with the slides. Okay, now it is. Um, yeah, okay, perfect. With respect to uh, dynamic hydronic balancing solutions. And um, it is probably worth starting considering that still uh, nowadays, the energy efficiency potential in all sorts of industries and vertical markets and infrastructure is still uncapped, uh, still very much capped. So if you look at building, for example, um, according to different institutes, the energy efficiency potential is uh, unrealized. And we could estimate that only 20% across the buildings worldwide has thought today uh, reached has not reached an adequate level of energy efficiency. And um, in addition to this, 
uh, it also has to be said that uh, uh, we all know that the world today is changing and the market and the industry itself is undergoing a deep transformation. And this means that even the buildings where people execute their tasks and their jobs are changing as well. In fact, in the past, if you look at a typical building, uh, it was maybe 20 years ago, but um, even earlier than that, it was always dedicated to pretty much the same usage. For example, office blocks always occupied during working days and then unoccupied over the weekends. But today, with flexible rental options, faster market dynamics of many new businesses, uh, you know, the, the usage of the building becomes much more flexible. And um, even more, if you look at the future, uh, connectivity to the cloud, to external networks, uh, to the internet, will be definitely the game changer for the overall efficiency of buildings and infrastructure. Um, so if you uh, look back for a minute to the history of uh, the energy efficiency with regards to valve and actuator in the hydronic balancing context, there is the long path which is finally arriving to what we today call uh, intelligent valves. And the interesting part of this path come when dynamic balancing technologies were invented. Uh, it is now like 20 years ago, the first time we saw uh, mechanical automatic balancing devices. And, um, and we, we, we could consider uh, this moment somewhere in between these two, these two points. And uh, thanks to these technologies, companies are nowadays um, able to offer solutions which are all pretty much based on dynamic balancing. For example, I mean, we believe that PSEV technology is becoming the standard that should be used in every environment and section of the buildings or infrastructure's distribution water system. Obviously, on terminal units, but also, and you will see later in the presentation of Jörg, in the distribution and generation parts, even when PSEV are already installed. So let's take, for example, the case of a renovation of a building, which require an extension of the hydronic system, of the hydronic network. But it could have also been uh, a reduction or just a change of terminal units. Say you want to replace all fan coils. The same applies. And if you want to readapt the hydronic system to the new configuration, uh, if you're looking for using the old technology like static balancing, then uh, many of you know that you need to recommission the complete system, even the parts that are not involved in the changes. And this is something that you definitely don't want to do. And, um, and this, uh, if you look, uh, as we know, for a static valve solution, it means a lot of redesign work. You don't want to do all of these again, right? As well as on-site readjusting and, uh, uh, and commissioning. So a lot of time, money, and resources are employed for this purpose. Um, but if you want to optimize the efficiency of this process, you can then opt for PACV. Uh, but what is a PACV? And why the benefits are not only related to the commissioning and water balancing aspect of the whole project. Um, let's see, uh, just as a recap, a PACV is typically three devices in one. It is a control valve. Uh, it has a manual flow presetting for commissioning. And the dynamic balancing is granted thanks to the mechanical differential pressure regulator built in the valve. Uh, but today, we are not looking at PSEV technology, as mentioned. We covered this before. <laughs> we would like to have a look at the energy performance of a dynamic balancing solution system with mechanical PSEV and how this can be improved by the use of intelligent valves. So let's consider a cooling application. Um, thanks for introducing the slides uh, uh, at the beginning because it fits perfectly. Um, uh, this is a very simple schematic, right? The chiller sends cold water to the coil of the air handling unit, and the incoming air uh, in the duct is cooled accordingly. And after transmitting its thermal energy, the water returns slightly warmer, right? 
The system in this case is designed to operate at full load with six degrees flow temperature and 12 return. So we have a difference of six degrees, and this is what we call delta T. And this difference is very important because a chiller works most efficiently when this gap is the largest. So what you want to do is to keep the delta T at the highest possible level. Uh, but what happens when you control this loop with a static control valve? <clears throat> Obviously, in real life, you're not going to have just one coil in your hydronic distribution system. You're going to have many coils. The system would be more complicated and there are many factors that influence the energy demand and therefore the return temperature. For example, at the beginning of a meeting with a large audience in a conference room, you need extra capacity. Or at the beginning of the week, when uh, switch from reduced comfort to normal mode, you need extra capacity. And when the chiller pumps more energy in the system, if you have a standard valve which has no capability of compensating pressure fluctuations, then you end up having overflow during these moments. But because the flow is distributed unevenly, the energy is not properly transmitted where you need it. So you're going to have excess over energy, but somewhere the energy is lacking because there's too much of it somewhere else. And in this case, the return temperature is lower. The delta T is lower. For instance, if the delta T gets reduced to 2 degrees, the chiller loses efficiency by a significant amount. And uh, I mean, the exact amount of loss efficiency depends on the chiller itself and on the specific duty point of the system. But I guess the point is um, is pretty clear. And um, the, the first, a first and very good mitigation measure is to use PACVs. Because thanks to the dynamic balancing compensation, the flow in the terminal unit is always limited to 100% of the design flow. Therefore, the energy transfer as more efficient with a delta T of, let's say, in this example, it's five degrees. Uh, that means that the pump is not using uh, as much electricity uh, and the chiller works quite efficiently already. Nevertheless, let me also mention for a second that a PACV alone, a mechanical device, can never guarantee you that your delta T is going to be always the highest simply because a PSCV can only control the flow. That's the purpose it was designed for and has no direct influence on the temperature. So for this, if you want to improve this, you need to use intelligent valve. But these, these conditions, these examples, provide you already uh, a saving of up to 30% energy and preserves comfort. Um, as a support of this statement, this 30% saving, uh, there are already available several independent studies in literature, independent and not. And uh, maybe I would suggest to have a look at these two documents, which explains a little bit more into details how and why such a savings could be achieved. Um, on the left, you have the Siemens white paper, uh, and this Documents deal with energy savings in a real case for um, the Middle Eastern region. I think it's Saudi Arabia. Um, and then before handing over to my colleague and see what the intelligent valve can do to improve even further the delta T, let me just mention what you will see in this other independent energy report of uh, this, the British Institute, Bistria, and how if you look at the electrical consumptions of the secondary pump, you can save even much more than 30%. And um, this is basically a summary uh, that you would find in the report. Um, if you look at just the red and the blue piping layout, uh, we can now compare the energy performance uh, of two different valve sets show up there. The first one at the top is a static control valve with a manual balancing valve. And uh, you don't see it, but uh, in the riser, there is also there are also differential pressure control valves to de decouple the circuits. And the second one is a PACV arrangement. So without manual balancing valves, and obviously, and without DPCVs. And it is very interesting that uh, uh, we will be able to check 
thanks to this report, to what extent the energy saving can get if you mix the right combination of valves with the correct pump control strategy. So what is the pump control strategy? As you know, uh, today we pretty much only have variable speed pumps in hydronic system. And they can be controlled at least in three main different ways. Uh, the first one is cost and pressure. So you see the black dotted curve here. This is basically the pump is going to change its speed in order to always maintain the same head in the system, no matter what the flow. The third one, the second one is proportional pump speed control. Uh, so the head will be reduced in a linear fashion, depending on the, uh, the, the system conditions. So if the terminal units are open, close, uh, so basically on the resistance of the system. And um, also interesting that you can control the pump by means of a, a remote sensor. Uh, we could speak for hours about this. This is a, a very interesting topic in my opinion, but to be short, Imagine a system like this one, and then you install a differential pressure sensor somewhere, uh, not necessarily by the, less, the least favorite circuit, but nearby this area. And this sensor communicates with the pump. So this method um, by the Bilsria report is called remote sensor pump speed control. And as I said, it's the, where the pump is driven according to the signal of a sensor which monitors the trend of the delta P in a specific point of the system. And this point is called the index circuit. In reality, we know that we don't always place it there, but somewhere along this line. <clears throat> so once we understand what is done, we can now check what happens to the energy consumption of the pump if I use a traditional valve set, static valve set, or PSAVs with different pump control strategy. And um, uh, in the first case, uh, with uh, cost and pressure control, if we compare two port control valves, so the arrangement B against PSAV, which you see, so we are basically looking at these two red lines, and uh, you can see that we can save 25% of the pump electrical consumptions if we run the pump to the, with, in this mode. But if you look at the remote sensor here, then if this goes even beyond and reach a relevant amount of 50% reduction of the secondary energy consumptions of the pump. Amazing, right? And so this is absolutely no question that PACV provide a very great benefit to the hydronic distribution system and energy balance. But is it worth the cost? And for many of you that are familiar with PACV designs, it is obvious to see that there is no longer need for manual balancing valves because PACV is three valves in one, as we said before. And therefore, you can eliminate any other control or balancing element. But not only. In fact, it is clearly much easier to balance a new or refurbished system as there is no painful iteration along the coils of the whole building. So summarizing and closing, considering a use case of a building with 500 rooms, it could be a hotel, for example, and uh, consider the standard cost of control devices, as well as the standard hourly labor costs, the savings can reach and an overcome 25%, like in this example. The overall cost, if you switch to static balancing to dynamic balancing. And this is amazing, uh, but it, this is just the beginning of the journey. Because now I am going to hand over the microphone to my colleague, Jörg Heil, who will continue to deep dive into these dynamic balancing energy savings opportunities. And um, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your attention. And uh, I'll see you later for uh, the Q&A session. Um, let me just uh, make your organizer. OK, your, the stage is yours. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Luca. Um,
My name is Jörg Heil, uh, as already mentioned in the uh, beginning. Uh, I'm also, as Luca Baroli, product manager within Siemens uh, Smart Infrastructure for Valves and Actuators, and I welcome you to this uh, seminar. Uh, Luca, just a question. Do you see my screen? Do you see the presentation clearly? Ah, I don't. Just go in presentation mode. I am in presentation okay. mode. Now it works. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's continue. Um, what are the potentials even beyond uh, pressure independent control valves um, with intelligent valve solutions in regards of optimizing energy, in regarding of uh, uh, even improved um, not only flow balancing and dynamic hydraulic balancing, but also temperature management and dynamic power management in a uh, installation. Here we are at the starting point where uh, the PICV uh, shows his, its, uh, 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 its use case. Uh, you have the flow under control. We avoid excessive overflows to the coils. Uh, we omit that coils are starving. We have optimized basically the pump energy. This very excessive overflows we have seen in the uh, starting presentation with seven times the uh, the design flow we have already under control. But how can we do uh, more? How can we do a better power distribution to the different raises? How can we optimize uh, also the temperature, uh, the delta T uh, in these uh, uh, applications? How can we guarantee that each raiser gets the power he needs? and optimizing efficiency and with efficiency also operation cost. Um, what do we need for this? On the one hand side, we have the flow now under control a little bit passively by the PICVs, but we do not know where we have topics with delta T in this distribution system. We do not know the flow and return temperatures, but we should do. We do not know which razor gets how much uh, power, but we should know. And to know this, we need an intelligent solution and we need also a connection into the BMS system or into other uh, management systems. Now, I would like to show you a little bit the, um, what an intelligent solution would look like uh, and where it is different to a mechanical PICV. An intelligent solution don't just know what is the maximum flow set point and control uh, dynamically the flow, but it has more elements. Uh, it knows due to this precise uh, ultrasonic flow uh, meter, anytime during operation, which flow goes into this razor, into this air handling unit. Then it is usually uh, having a precise pair of temperature sensors, not only to measure flow, but to uh, give the possibility to measure energy. And because sensor, flow sensor and temperature sensors are connected to the local integrated controller, um, the controller is more or less already like a heat meter, not with the precision uh, and the uh, uh, certificate of a heat meter, but it is, already very accurate. It is within a, a two plus minus two percent uh, energy measurement uh, on this single intelligent device. And we have uh, for sure to have a precise and high resolution valve actuator combination to do the dynamic balancing, which usually in a PICV does uh, the pressure controller. Here we do this with this high um, resolution valve and actuator combination. The brain of this solution is the controller and this controller provides the capabilities now uh, not only to control the flow dynamically but also uh, to dynamically control power distribution to the raises and especially it's able to control the delta t across the razor or the air handling unit coil and so on. And then on the right hand side, you see this controller is not a standalone device somewhere uh, only in the hydraulic network. It's also connected 
by Bugnet into the uh, building automation controller. So the building automation controller can also uh, um, exchange and, and uh, get the information to extend the comfort control. And it's also able then by Bugnet to integrate into the building management system for more transparency. Now it seems to be quite complicated uh, because this is now a, a controller, but it's a modern controller. So for it's not only a black box for local troubleshooting. If your uh, uh, service staff goes uh, onto the plant, there are mobile apps uh, provide, allowing you to connect to this controller locally, allow your troubleshooting. The controller uh, gives also alarms and status indications. Uh, to this mobile app and to allow the staff to have everything on control locally and uh, to do service locally. Basically, in the starting point, an intelligent valve solution is a PICV, um, an electronic PICV, and it, but it acts like a PICV. Uh, there are some slight differences like uh, in regards of how fast is this dynamic balancing acting. The electronic solution acts a little bit more moderate. The PICV is very fast. The um, intelligent valve solution might not be able to solve very, very high delta Ps uh, like uh, PICVs today, but it uh, solves moderate uh, uh, delta Ps. And then the, the uh, deviations Uh, have not to go really to the device uh, in front of the device. And then the really advantages start and, and differentiation start. With the electronic intelligent valve solution, you have always real-time flow, temperatures, and power um, under control. And also uh, you have the transparency about this. And the building automation controller can react on changes in this, can reprioritize between different air handling units and so on. Then locally with this power measurement based on flow and temperatures, you can limit power to different zones, uh, to the raises, to a certain air handling unit. Uh, there you can do not only a flow limitation, but you can do a power limitation because that's what the rooms need. They need power, not only flow. Then temperature, the topic of today, Delta T limitation, this is uh, the focus of the, of the with it, you know, intelligent valve solutions, you can do an even advanced Delta T limitation locally, and then the network integration um, into the building management system. So here are uh, an overview about uh, the differentiation topics for the intelligent solutions. Let's dive a little bit deeper how, um, a system you know, could look like here we have the situation with the PICVs. Uh, PICVs in all the rooms for each and any fan coil. I think that what Luca presented is the efficient, uh, cost efficient solution. You have the flow in any fan coil under control. You can somehow guarantee the comfort for the user in the rooms. Uh, they get the right flow, they get somehow also the right energy uh, if the uh, system, the generation is able to provide the uh, amount of energy. And then on the on the raises and for the big consumers in the air handling units, you can use the intelligent valve solutions. You can add the intelligent valve on the raises. Uh, then you have on the one hand side also uh, the distribution on the raiser level under control in regards of flow but also in regards of power, you can say this razor uh, is allowed to get uh, this amount of power, this razor is allowed to get this amount of power. And if your supply temperature fluctuates a little bit due to high loads at the moment or something like that, 
you can still guarantee um, that the power is distributed correctly. On the other hand side, delta T. Delta T not on any coil and uh, any uh, fan coil unit, but delta T in the whole system to provide an optimum uh, operation point for the chiller brand. So that is uh, the, the main topic. Now we heard it already uh, in the beginning, how is delta T influencing the energy efficiency and also the operation costs? Clearly on the one hand side, we have seen with decreasing delta T, we will need more and more flow, which the chiller have to provide, the chiller plant has to provide. And more and more flow, somewhere it's not uh, even possible to increase the flow and um, the different raises will uh, start to starve down, to not uh, fully uh, supplied with the right amount of power. And this is one topic. And the high flows also um, would need a, a very high amount of uh, pumping energy on that side. On the other side, the chiller efficiency is based uh, on the return temperature from the plant. So to operate a chiller uh, from uh, 9C to 6C is much less efficient than to operate the chiller from 12C, what maybe is the design uh, return temperature, to 6C. So there, due to the coefficient of performance of the chiller plant, we have a clearly influence on efficiency based on the delta T. And why we influence delta T and not only the return temperature? Because we are not always sure if the supplied temperature is constant. The delta T is a much more flexible um, uh, element in the system to react on. Maybe we have different uh, supply temperatures levels in the system and so on. Uh, so delta T for each of the raises would be really uh, the key to increase um, chiller efficiency and to reduce pumping costs. Um, let's continue with the example Luca presented for the PICVs. Due to the flow limitation, we have already uh, a certain influence on delta T because we avoid overpumping, because we avoid um, too less uh, uh, retur uh, too high return temperatures already with the flow limitation of the PICV, we have a certain uh, energy savings uh, achieved here. Uh, why that? Quite easily, this is the uh, performance curve of a coil. Um, this is the power over the volume flow through a uh, cooling coil uh, with a certain dimension, with a certain sizing. And this is the, from this uh, uh, volume flow and this uh, power distribution resulting delta T on the uh, right axis, we see the delta T now with this uh, red line or purple uh, line. Delta T with increasing power transmission is decreasing down to the design point and even lower. And if we don't uh, limit to the design point, but if we allow with the standard valve, each and any volume flow basically based on the pressure, pressure situation in the plant, we will go down to 4K uh, delta T or even lower. With the PICV, we have the first uh, step achieved. With the PICV, uh, we guarantee that we have not more than design flow. Uh, uh, over the coil and with the design flow uh, we have achieved at least in this example 5k uh, delta t and the design power of 600 uh, kilowatt now and here the uh, intelligent valve solutions kick in they have the temperatures measured locally they have the temperature and delta t information and they can now actively control the delta T limitation on the coils, on the raises. How they do that? They reduce even more the volume flow. By reducing the volume flow now, you, you may mention, okay, reducing the volume flow means also reducing the power. But on the other hand side, with reducing the volume flow, we increase the delta T as shown here. 
now we are back on designed LTT in high load uh, conditions on 6K. Uh, so we maximize the delta T to design conditions. We improve the chiller efficiency. And by improving the chiller efficiency and reducing the volume flow, we save some additional uh, uh, energy uh, costs in uh, comparison to a PICV. And this, in this slide with the transmission curve of the coil, uh, power over volume flow, this looks like here. This was the design situation without any delta T limitation on the coil side. And if we jump into the intelligent solution, then we see there is a clearly reduction on volume flow by, in this example, around 20%, down to 80% of the design flow. And also there is an increase in the delta T. And what you see, the comfort level here, or the energy transmission level of the coil is not that highly influenced by this reduced of the volume flow, but it's slightly influenced. Clearly, it goes a little bit back on this curve, but the curve is very flat in this full load conditions. So it's going back only from 600 uh, kilowatt down to 578, which is the reduction of 3%. What means this 3% in regards of temperature, because energy is what we distribute, but controlling, finally, we would like to control comfort to the people. What would it mean? It would mean that you not cool down Um, hey, Jörg, I think uh, your voice uh, has gone. Delta T. Jörg, can you just go um, two minutes back and repeat? Uh, we lost you for the last one minute. Okay, sorry for that. Um, hopefully it, it works now. Yeah, then let's um, start maybe here. That was clear, 7% no, and I was so on. Already at, at the 3%. You can start from the three percent reduction. Okay. Uh, so exactly. What so what's what's happening if I do really locally control delta T limitation to avoid a too low delta T from the um, air handling unit coils from the razors? I reduce volume flow here roughly by by twenty percent to keep the six k delta T, and this due to the flat curve of the transmission, of the energy and power transmission on the coil, which is a flat behavior in this full load and high load conditions, I only reduce the amount of power I transmit by this air handling unit cooling coil by 3%. What means 3% in regards of temperature? Let's imagine you cool down from 30 degrees outside temperature to 18 degrees supply temperature. Without delta T limitation, you will end up in this 80 degree, eight, 18 degrees supply temperature. With the 3% reduction on power here, you will end up roughly in 18.3 degrees supply temperature, which nobody will really realize on the comfort level in, uh, in, the, in the rooms and so on. So there is clearly with the delta T limitation an additional potential to reduce energy costs due to lower volume flow in the system, lower pumping cost, uh, and with that also uh, an increased efficiency on the chiller, so lower operation costs on the chiller side. Um, this I compared here, what could be the use cases for intelligent devices. I mentioned this intelligent devices for the bigger consumers, for the uh, razors to keep Delta T under control. On the left-hand side, this would be an example for uh, an owner used building. Um, cooling <clears throat> generation is done by a local chiller plant. The other safe with um, this is a Delta T 
limitation and the efficiency improvement, you save operating costs for this building owner uh, over the over the years. On the right hand side, this is a slightly different use cases. Let's imagine you don't have a dedicated chiller plant for the building, but the buildings are connected to a district cooling network. There usually you have contracted not only a certain uh, power capacity you are able or allowed as a user to consume. You are usually also have contracted to maintain a certain delta T across the uh, connection point um, um, and the um, district cooling uh, substation you might have uh, in the um, uh, basement of the building to avoid any penalties and to guarantee uh, to the utility and to follow your contract with the utility to guarantee this delta T uh, um, limitation there you can use the intelligent devices as well so that uh, you are uh, have a good relationship with your uh, utility finally or the user has a good relationship to his utility because he has done anything he can um, <clears throat> to uh, perform a good delta t performance uh, of the plant in the building and to good good delta t performance also in this district cooling network so these are a little bit two different use cases but both Coming back to the installation uh, situation, uh, intelligent solutions with delta T limitations on air handling units and on the razors. And also on the big, maybe fan coils. If you have, there are very big fan coils with, I don't know, five cubic meters, 10 cubic meters, then those parts also, they may also be uh, attractive for an intelligent solution. Smaller fan coils, one kilowatt, two kilowatts, they, from my point of view, their EPICV solution is more, uh, a PICV, sorry, not EPI, but a PICV solution, mechanical PICV solution is more comfortable. What do these expected uh, additional 7% of energy uh, savings by um, a Delta T control uh, on the main user, uh, main consumers, mean in regards of uh, payback time or uh, in and on investments. Here is uh, our so-called building proxy. That's a uh, sample building. Uh, we're starting at the same point where we start with the PICVs, 500 rooms with 500 fan coils uh, for the PICVs. But there is also a, a distribution network with the razors in front of these. And there we have used intelligent valves for these distribution raises and we use intelligent valves for the uh, bigger air handling units uh, here for air handling units um, and then uh, this building uh, we expect is such of these buildings with the chillip in the basement um, used by the owner uh, itself so how can we judge the additional investment in these 20 intelligent devices to make it short um, it's a little bit based clearly on the energy costs uh, you have let's assume we have round about 1000 megawatt hours or 980 megawatt hours of yearly energy uh, consumption energy costs in this example are assumed to want to be 100 euro per megawatt hour so typically we are spending 100,000 or 98,000 uh, euros uh, on energy um, uh, to this building uh, in regards of thermal energy. Uh, if we save 7%, this ends up in some 6,860 euros savings year by year. On the other hand side, we have to invest into the intelligent valves instead of, let's say, pressure independent control valves uh, on the air handling units and on the raises as well. So uh, we have additional costs of around 7,500, 8,000 euros. But overall, we have a payback time for such an intelligence solution less than two years. So that's the rough, the rough rule of thumb from our point of view. Intelligent valve solutions to control delta T 
uh, will basically pay off uh, within a period of two years if these conditions like the 100 euro per kilowatt uh, per, per megawatt hour uh, are the truth um, and uh, if we concentrate on the main distribution network in the building on the main consumers. Now, what in addition we can do with uh, the Intelligent Valve uh, solutions, what in addition we can do beyond these uh, local optimization like the Delta T uh, limitation over the coils. As I mentioned before, Intelligent Valve solutions, as we see these in the market, they are not only local uh, devices, but they are network connected devices. And the solutions we see offer also, beside all this networking in the building networks like Bugnet or Modbus, they also offer quite often IP connectivity. This now gives us a chance uh, to connect these devices directly into cloud solutions, like shown here. Uh, cloud solutions, many of the building uh, management uh, companies now starting to provide cloud solutions uh, with uh, several applications on the top level, an application like the building operator for the comfort situation, for the comfort control, uh, a portal uh, Cerberus, that's uh, an example for a fire safety. Um, your voice again um Jörg we still cannot hear you Luca can you step in left hand side Maria, like the intelligent no. valve yeah it's back um Jörg, your voice just just up here again. Go one minute back and then start okay. again because we lost you for the last minute. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, let's start again. So these intelligent valve solutions we see on the market, they are not only local solutions for controlling the fan, um, controlling the air handling unit coil, controlling a razor, but they are also connected devices in the meantime. On the one hand side, connected into the building um, automation network to the controller, uh, to the building management system. On the other hand, we see solutions which are now able to directly connect into cloud solutions, like shown here. The building uh, automation manufacturers, um, they start to provide cloud solutions on the one hand side, like here, Cerberus portal for fire and safety. On the other hand, for comfort, like the building operator, uh, so comfort control, supervision. Also, they give uh, organizations the potential to offer services um, like energy reportings and so on. And with the intelligent valve solutions, we are now starting to connect directly into this cloud and not be based on complicated interactions with an automation level um, and uh, then from the automation level into building management system or into cloud solutions. But if you like a very slim and uh, effective solution, you can directly connect those solutions, energy valves, intelligent valves into cloud solutions. And then you have the opportunity here, if you are integrated on the one hand side to supervise uh, these intelligent uh, valves directly in the cloud, you see the temperatures, you see the current operation conditions of these. But even more interesting, you are getting energy reports out of this. You are having uh, uh, hourly breakdowns of energy consumption. You can also uh, have uh, breakdowns of other data points like you can uh, see the delta T across the coils uh, and have also a report about the delta T across the coils. So 
coming back to this district cooling network solutions if you have on the entrance to the buildings an intelligent valve solution you can easily connect these intelligent valve solutions into the cloud and then get a report about the uh, delta t behavior uh, of these buildings uh, available or you can go down to the um, a handling unit level and have the delta t solution of the last month available uh, as a report and, and see where does delta t not match to the operation conditions can i even improve my delta t setting uh, in the system to increase the delta t setting even the limitation to from 6 to 7k without major comfort influ uh, comfort uh, top issues and uh, so optimize the system so a direct cloud solution just from that point of view bypasses the complicated maybe also service intensive building management system nevertheless clearly these intelligent valve solutions they are today usually communicative controllers. They are communicative on Bucknet IP, for instance, or on Modbus solutions. So they can be integrated into the building automation controller level and then into the, the BMS level. And with that, if you are responsible for the operation of a certain building, then you get all the advantages uh, of these intelligent valves, the local alarming, if a sensor is failed, or if the delta t is too low for instance you uh, can can program uh, the bms system in this way that that you get alarms that you get uh, guided through the system navigated through the system from alarms into the specific uh, uh, part of the installation into the specific air handling unit and even then you can go down on uh, the device level and see how the device really acts currently in regards of flow, power, uh, and temperatures. And you get, uh, on the other hand side here, you get an alarming if um, these devices may have an, an issue, too low supply temperatures, for instance, could also be an issue. Then you get the alarms, you are guided through the building management system into uh, the part of the building, and then onto the device and can see what's happening there locally maybe is the actuator failed uh, is the supply temperature too low is something get stuck like uh, position is fully open but flow is not there what is happening is the strainer uh, blocked so two possibilities of integration of those intelligent solutions one hand side into the bms system uh, for local uh, operation from service experts on the other hand side integration into cloud solutions to operate by for instance just for information of the facility manager that that he gets a high level notification uh, if there is any topic and can then inform the specialists and guide the specialists directly to the right uh, solution okay as a summarize from that point of view, we are started. We have started with the PICVs managing the flow uh, distribution in the network. Now we are have seen what intelligent solutions can do. Uh, they can minimize uh, the energy consumption and they can optimize also the comfort uh, with this uh, minimized energy consumption. Why should we do that? Why should you use those devices instead of doing this with separate um, uh, uh, devices like heat meters and temperature sensors and program this into the building automation controllers? Here, you, you know what you get basically directly. You have not to think about how it should act, but it's pre-programmed, it's pre-configured. You can just activate the Delta T control on the device uh, you can set the delta t to your design specification that is very direct and very simple and easy to commission you don't need to program anything uh, you can directly also change it and you have the remote 
uh, access either through the building management system or through the cloud uh, to the device to do resettings, optimizations, and so on. Basically, also from that perspective, clearly those devices from the different suppliers, they are directly usually integrated and seamless integrated into their environment. So you might find in the diff from the different suppliers also on the building automation and building management level, a compound library which allows you to easy and seamless uh, integrate all the necessary data points into the building automation controller uh, and have the alarming pre-configured, uh, trending pre-configured if uh, you like to trend these on the BMS system instead of the cloud and so on. So there are a lot of advantages to using this pre-configured solution instead of doing it uh, by my own in each and any project individually. So I hope I could give you a short overview what intelligent devices could do even beyond uh, PICVs in regards of energy optimization, how such a solution could look like, where to place uh, these solutions in the network. And that's now um, the end of the presentation. So I'd like to thank you. And I guess now we are open for questions, Luca, correct? Yes, we are. Yep. Thank you, Jörg. Thank you, Luca, for the nice presentation. I can see a lot of questions from the attendees about the topics. And I think one of the common question which initially came was that uh, can the attendees get the presentation copy or the recording of the copy? The answer is yes, you all will get the copy of the presentation as well as the recording. Somebody from the Azure team will be in touch with you to provide the details. We have all and, your emails. Uh, uh, we have all your emails and uh, who's ever been in the seminar over here, he will get the, the live recording link uh, for the present and the presentation over here. Thank you, Mohammed, for the confirmation. So for the for the question on the topics, I have just segregated some of the question because we have limited time. So I'll try to take some of the question which uh, Luca and York can answer. So maybe Luca, I will start with you. The first question we have on the PACV technology is it looks DPCV in the main branches doesn't provide enough saving compared to PICV. Is it right? And the connecting question is, but can we maintain the main branch pressure if we have many number of fan coil unit with PICV? Yes, it is correct. The DPCVs um, uh, are not uh, installed alone in the system. Uh, you have to consider DPCVs are installed together with a control valve and a manual balancing valve. And uh, the independent reports but also our own studies prove that uh, by the time that you sum up uh, the pressure losses required by the dpcv to have enough authority for for to to maintain the control loop and uh, also with uh, the pressure loss of the control valve again to have enough authority to for the control loop uh, and uh, together with the pressure loss of the manual valve to do the balancing, then at the end of the day, PACV providing the minimum delta P, that startup pressure that needs to, to be fed with to provide cost and flow, then uh, it, uh, it, is less, um, it is less efficient. DPCV plus control valve plus manual. I hope it was clear. Okay. I, can, you, can you just repeat the other? Second question. Second part. The second is, can we maintain the main branch pressure if we have large number of fan coil units with PICV? Can we maintain the main branch pressure if we have a large number of fan coil units? I don't quite understand. I think uh, the base of the question is that do we really need DPCVs in the branches if we have the PICV oh, okay. terminally? Um, I would say there's no need to have the PCVs in the branches as long as the the delta P of the pump do, does not overcome the maximum pressure uh, that a PCV can handle. Uh, in uh, we have, for example, typically this pre maximum pressure is 600 kPa or six bar, 
and yeah. if your pump is bigger then maybe it is a good idea to to have some means that limits the pressure especially near in the risers near the pump yeah yeah i think in in general i would say to sum it up on this answer in our application we don't see the pumps going over six bar so to answer the question you don't need the dpcv if you have the pressure independent valve on all the terminal units if you have really right. high pressure from the pump then you might need it so it's on the on the particular case which you will have to see on the project right luca yes correct absolutely okay. correct thanks Aki. Another question, Luca, on the same line is that do we need DRV on the branches if we are using PACVs on the terminal unit? Um, you don't need double regulating valves or DRVs for balancing any branches anymore because uh, the whole balancing is provided at the terminal unit level. Um, I have seen many cases where people uh, still install DRVs because they have, uh, you know, the pressure ports and they like to measure the flow. This is the only, I mean, if you see, if you still see a DRV installed on a dynamically balanced hydronic system, it's because maybe commissioning engineers still would like to have a flow measurement device there. That's all, that's all. Okay. And we have another question on the PACV, is that what's the difference between the PACV and the PABCV? There's no difference, it's just a different name. Okay, so different manufacturers are using the different uh, nomenclature right. for their product. The, the, the first one stands for pressure independent control valves, and uh, the second acronym stands for pressure independent balancing control valve. But as a fact, if you look at the two valves, uh, they, they do exactly the same functions. So no difference. Okay, so the next question is how will the delta T will change when we have automatic control valves, we are talking about the two-way control valves, to the terminal unit of fan coil unit and air handling unit, which is actually regulating the flow to match the design delta T. So I think this question is a bit unclear to me as well, whether we are controlling the delta T from the air handling unit or we are controlling the, the zone temperature. I I think the best uh, explanation uh, was given by Jörg uh, in the slides where um, it was showing the curve of the terminal unit and also it was showing the trend of the delta T uh, with the flow in the same chart. And right. I think, uh, uh, and this is the best slide. So with the recording, everybody will be able to 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 see the slides and also listen to the explanation of Jörg even if the audio um, was missing for a couple of seconds but yeah exactly I think this is by far the best explanation and uh, it is also important to understand that it's fine even if uh, the, in the devices like intelligent valves if you give them um, the, the task to maintain a constant delta T, obviously, uh, the, this is the prior one, the top priority, right? So design flow is not anymore going to be a priority as well as the set point. Uh, so it's going to be, uh, you should carefully look at this. Do you want to prioritize the comfort of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the room that you want to, uh, to cool down or you want to prioritize the energy efficiency? And obviously, it's always a matter of uh, a trade-off between the two. All right. Next question on PICV is what will be the typical payback for retrofitting an existing system which has three-way valve and converting that system to PICV? Um, three-way valve system means constant uh, volume systems which means uh, the energy supply in the building is uh, always, or at least uh, the volume of water supply in the building is always 100%, no matter uh, the, the, the load required. And um, if you look at these, I suggest to have a look at this uh, independent case study because they also deal with, uh, uh, with uh, the energy consumption of uh, uh, a three, 
three ways of for, uh, control valve solutions. Uh, and this is taken as a reference, uh, uh, like 100% consumption. Then when you look at uh, uh, the variable flow with the PSTV or with manual valves, then you see that it is already uh, 50%, if I know, maybe you can go to that slide, Ankit, and uh, we can quickly look at it. Um, and the payback is certainly... I have the control of the slide right now. Okay, I think it's still here. Anyway, uh, it's the summer slides where, where, where with the energy, with the energy consumption. Yep, uh, this one here. No, I can't hear you. Look, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, it's uh, it's there. So you you can see already that uh, the the cost and flow uh, option is, uh, you know, the, the worst case, right? It is the worst case. And uh, compared with PSV, if you stay on that slide, you see that uh, it is, uh, if you go back on that slide, in, uh, in the cost and pressure control, you save, uh, you go from 80 to 60, so you save 30%. Uh, but if you go with remote sensor control, you go from 80 down to 25. So such uh, an energy savings uh, results probably in uh, uh, the same payback time as uh, shown before by your with intelligent valve, less than a year, I would say. Yeah. But the payback, and look at, the payback depends yeah, on the specific investment. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, hard, to hard to give a number that applies for all cases, right? Yeah, and I think it also depends upon the kind of application as well, whether you have, uh, you know, the system which is working for 24 hours a day or it's working for 16 hours a day. What's the load profile and what are the ambient conditions? So overall, the system has to be studied and then we can come to the conclusion right. of that. You have the payback of two years, three years, less or high. Correct, correct. Yeah. Okay, so look, I'll just move to the next question, which is actually connecting for PACV as well as for intelligent valve. Is the system with PACV and intelligent valve self-balancing and not required balancing at site, or is it required? We get there one day. Uh, currently, mechanical PACV has to be uh, balanced. Uh, what is the benefit? of uh, uh, when you balance a mechanical PSV against uh, a traditional manual control valve. Uh, the benefit is that um, uh, you don't need to run through this KV calculation. You don't need to do anything of this. Uh, you normally, oh, every manufacturer provide uh, mobile apps or Excel tables. So you just need to go there and position the manual flow presetting uh, in the position that you uh, you are you are told, and uh, yeah. uh, in addition to this, there's no more uh, iteration on the loops. You know that with a manual valve, when you adjust a, a loop, then the the water flow changes also in the loops nearby. So you have to visit at in in the same floor. You have to at least move your uh, ladder. Or your platform uh, uh, two or three times, which result be before you are done, which results in the, uh, a lot of time employed by 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 the, by the commissioning specialists. So no, it is not commission free. You still have to go on site with mechanical PACVs. Uh, if you had a system with complete intelligent valve, then maybe it is commission free. So you can do anything via remote. Uh, if we look at what we can provide at Siemens, so now I'm talking about specific solution for mechanical PSTV, we also have uh, a way to do remote commissioning on mechanical PSTV, but this is not a standard in the industry. This is just a specific solution. All right. Okay, uh, my next question is uh, to Jörg. Uh, so what are the commissioning requirements for the intelligent valve solution? The commissioning requirements are that uh, basically you have uh, the water in the, the, the pipes are filled, uh, the pump is running, 
and you need the power supply to the intelligent valve devices because you you need to uh, connect to this device with the mobile app so it has to be it has to be running and you then you can do the presetting and also okay. the setting of the delta t limitation and so on so you're saying all the features which are there in the product is available on the app and then once it's connected to the with the system then you can actually do it remotely yes okay i think it's clear so the next question on the intelligent valve is uh, is it uh, compatible with backnet mstp interface uh, the siemens solution today not no okay, siemens solution having... provides backnet ip but not backnet mm -hmm. mstp okay i'll move on to the next question if the building has two way valves in the existing uh, project will the intelligent valve will bring more saving if it is installed on the risers or on the branches uh your this is yes that's uh, yeah that's that's a yes because then you can do this uh, delta t control on the intelligent valve uh, i expect yeah. then that the uh, the two-way valves are just standard uh, control valves yes these are standard control mm -hmm. valves which yeah. are in the existing building yes okay the next question is would a chiller supply water temperature reset achieve better saving than delta t control supply reset um okay let me let me just rephrase it so you have one function in the chiller which is called the water temperature reset i believe yeah. i'm not 100 percent sure on it so will that function will be better than the delta t control in the system or delta t control is better than chiller water temperature reset there i'm sorry but i don't know the function on this uh, this chiller side okay so maybe i can do one thing that we can uh, take this question at the later stage and we can call the the attendee personally and check what exactly the question is yes yeah okay another question is if the building is connected to district cooling plant without low delta t penalties how much saving will the valve provide for the building owners that's basically depending on the uh contract conditions with the uh, utility with the district cooling utility yeah that's hard to say basic. that's depending yeah. on how often would i without delta t control violate my contract conditions and how how big are my penalties to to violate this allow me to elaborate more a little bit in this question uh, because it is typically here we have the district cooling provider uh, they are applying a low delta t penalties on the customer who brought the low delta t so i think this is will add more advantage by using uh, intelligent uh, picv because it will help the owner of this building to avoid the low delta t it will add uh, more in the costing because he be also low delta t penalties to the district cooling provider in addition to the normal saving what you get it in the energy uh, consumption itself so that you you are saving in the energy from other side and you are saving uh, the penalties which will add an advantage for such uh, intelligent uh, PACP valve uh, that is i think from my end yeah so if you I may answer keep, on this yeah. yeah i just wanted to add something on it uh, the alarm possibility is uh, crucial to that because uh, uh, if you don't notice that you are violating the delta t and you you, you find out uh, uh, too late then uh, the penalty could be, could be different so having the possibility to detect any deviation uh, in the behavior or the performance of the system through alarms or real-time alarms it's 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 important and a mechanical PSEV unfortunately cannot do that okay yep. right thank you luca so i'll go to the next question and your it's for you uh, the intelligent valve first controls the chill water flow to the design flow rate then reduce the flow to achieve the delta t or it directly controls the delta t first 
So under normal conditions, it's controlling first the uh, the flow to the design flow rate, and when then achieving the design flow rate or a, a value near to the design flow rate, then it uh, sees a too low delta p. Then it will uh, go to the delta t control. Okay. As long and as have... delta t is big enough, then it will always go to design flow rate if it gets a 100% set point. Okay, and then the design flow rate is basically what you will preset on the valve. Yes, okay. like with the PICV. Yeah. Great. So another question on intelligent valve is, can you please advise in the district cooling network system where exactly should be intelligent valve installed in case of energy transfer station? So what would be the, the location of the intelligent valve on a district cooling plant? Is it going to be in energy transfer station or is it going to be somewhere else? That now depends on, on the energy transfer station in the district cooling network. If you really have an uh, energy transfer station which is shifting the uh, decoupling with a heat exchanger from the district cooling system into the building system and if you have a temperature level change from the district cooling system network to the building system then you can install uh, an intelligent valve in this transfer station and uh, use the delta t control um, to uh, avoid too low delta t's Okay, I'll go to the last question. I think we are already out of uh, the time. So I'll just take the last question and then I will hand it over to our colleague from ASHRAE. So the last question to Jörg is, what is the largest size of the intelligent valve? Can be used at the, can it be used at the entrance of the large high rise towers? Also, how will the low flow affect the comfort for the occupants? I think it's the same question which was actually answered by Luca. It's basically when you have the intelligent valve on the uh, riser or on the branches, you are controlling the delta T there. How would it affect the comfort for the tenants and especially for the tenants who are basically at the end of the uh, circuit? Yeah, yes. let's let's go back maybe to um, to this. Hopefully, yeah, to this slide. Um, when will low delta T happen? Low delta T will not happen uh, when you are at 25, 30, 40 percent of um, of power consumption uh, of load situation. Delta T will happen when this consumer, the air handling unit, is on the edge of the, the needed power consumption. And on the edge of the needed power consumption, the curve or the relation between flow limitation and comfort violation is a, is a very flat one. So uh, I don't see really a huge damage to the comfort situation when activating a delta T control uh, on the uh, on the consumers. Okay. On the other hand side, the intelligent valve itself has a clear priority if you activate delta t control then the delta t control has priority above uh, volume flow control but okay. if you do it uh, smart on the building automation controller you can also give the tenant uh, the opportunity to override temporarily the delta t control if he is good with this and if he is willing to pay the extra amount of let's say energy costs um, then you can say okay for a certain period or as long as uh, he wants he can override the delta t control uh, and prioritize uh, the comfort control but you cannot have both you cannot have on the one hand side optimized uh, energy efficiency limiting delta t and on the other hand a very accurate um, 
uh, uh, comfort control in full load conditions. Okay, so Jörg, it's clear that we have to set the priority as per the application, whether we want to control the, the flow first or we want to control the delta T. So yes, I think the tenant or the end user has to decide based on the, the project and their requirement. Okay, I think this was the last question. I know we have a lot of questions which are pending, but unfortunately due to the limitation of time, we won't be able to answer it on this forum. But somebody from uh, Siemens will be in touch with you at the later stage to answer uh, each and every question. And uh, we will come back to you on this uh, shortly. And I would like to hand over this to colleague from Ashray, Mohammed. Yes. Um, so, sorry, no. sorry. If I may also, uh, before passing it on to Mohammed, I would like to give um, very big thanks to uh, Mohammed, uh, to Abdullah, Hassan, and Osama from Ashray for making this possible uh, today. And uh, I hope everyone uh, enjoyed today's session and uh, stay tuned uh, for more collaborations with the, with the great Ashray team. And uh, thank you all one more time. Uh, really, uh, on behalf of Ashri uh, Falcon Chapter, we would like to thank you, uh, Luca, George, uh, Mohammed, and uh, the team from Siemens for their continuous support uh, for Ashri Falcon Chapter and providing us uh, with this uh, valuable technical information, which was uh, really a very interesting uh, uh, seminar and presentation with more than 500 attendees in this uh, session, so that. Uh, I think uh, really it is a remarkable uh, seminar. Uh, back uh, to our housekeeping, uh, we have uh, our next seminar will be uh, next Friday, 4 p.m. Uh, the speaker will be our Falcon Chapter President, uh, Mr. Hassan Yunus, uh, and uh, it will be Introduction to Energy Management and Energy Audits. Uh, uh, wish all of you will be over there. We uh, we will send the invitation to the all member, and you can distribute it over there. Uh, thank you again, uh, Luca and George, for this uh, interesting uh, seminar, and uh, wish to see you in the uh, more and more seminars like that. Thank you a lot. I appreciate it.